everybody. How you doing? Can I get a honk if you good to play? It's good to see each of you here this morning. If you're joining with us online, it's so good to have you as well. Um, we've got a beautiful morning, uh, a little overcast, but it's just right. And so we're going to come and uh, praise God this morning. And He's blessed us each week as we've met and as we came together. Um, and I'll tell you, we've been so blessed with the weather and different things. And so uh, this morning, we're going to praise God. We're going to sing Glorious Day um, to start off. Um, and we have some other things that we're going to do throughout the service. But if you're with us for the first time, um, if you're with us in the parking lot, it's 107.7 on your radio. You can also just roll down your windows and listen. If um, You also have the words on our church website and on Facebook and different things uh, to the song. So we're going to praise Him this morning and just uh, uh, give God the glory. So let's praise, okay? place and we just sing songs of praise father as we lift our prayers and petitions up to you this morning we just thank you father for all you have done and all you will do father i know there may be people that are suffering with sickness 
or ailments, or Father, those that are battling from fatigue because they've been working so many hours and helping in our health care professions or those that are on the front lines. Father, we pray for those. Father, we pray for those that may have possibly been out of work, Lord, and they may have a, a, a heavy heart this morning as they come because they have a strain with finances or income or whatever's going on. Father, we pray because we may have something going on in our lives with our children or with our health or whatever it may be. And Father, we pray for all those that are affected as well by the coronavirus and different things and other sicknesses and cancers that are going on. Lord, we just lift all these things up to you, Father. We know you're the ultimate healer and physician, and you hear all of our prayers. And Father, we just ask you for the peace that passes all understanding. As we go through these things, Father, help us to have a, just a heart of love and joy. Father, a heart that comes to you this morning and just lifts you up. And Father, may we just put you first in all that we say and do. Father, help us draw closer to you this morning as we praise and lift our, our hands and our hearts and our eyes to you this morning, Lord. Father, we just thank you for all things. In your Son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to continue singing this morning. and uh, We've actually got Nadine that's going to join us this morning. and She's going to be doing sign language with uh, uh, Draw Me Close. So sing along with us, okay? on a daily basis. So if you've brought your communion items, we want you to go ahead and get those prepared. 
Um, if you brought cracker and juice of any kind, if you're at home with us and you'd like to partake of communion with us, um, what we're going to do is we're going to sing a couple of songs. We're going to sing Holy, Holy, Holy and How He Loves. After that, Mitchell's going to come up and do a meditation. And um, he'll have prayer and then he'll instruct us when to take the uh, communion together, okay? Uh, but let's just sing to God this morning, uh, Holy, Holy, Holy and How He Loves. Yeah, he loves us. 
country would be tried during the Revolutionary War, and for the following 200 plus years, through various trials and tribulations, the souls of this country's people and the country itself has been tried many times. Right now we are being tried uh, like none of us have ever remembered. But at this time of communion, I think about the night that Jesus was betrayed. Imagine the trial that his soul was going through at the moment, knowing that he was going to be falsely accused, falsely betrayed, falsely tried, falsely crucified. Knowing the agony and the pain that he would suffer. At one point, sweating drops of blood and asking the Father if there be any other way that this cup would be removed from Him. But it wasn't to be that way. He, in the end, went with the will of the Father and willingly gave Himself there on that cross at Calvary. Innocent blood on our behalf. Yes, we have been tried many times and probably will be as long as we live in this world. But none of us has ever been tried like our Savior was tried 2,000 years ago. He did it for us out of pure love. And this morning, as we gather around this, I'll call it table, to partake of this loaf and this cup, we are to focus back on that seen there at Calvary, picturing Jesus there as he hung on that cross, as he was broken and bloody, the crown of thorns on his head, the agony that he went through for me, for you. This is the time where we will remember that and hopefully give thanks for that sacrifice that he made on our behalf. Otherwise, we would have no hope. Yes, we're going through a difficult time in our nation. And a lot of people seem not to have hope. But no matter the outcome, whether it lasts six months or the next six years, you and I, if we belong to Jesus, we have hope. And as this time this morning, we're going to remember that and remember that sacrifice that he made at Calvary. At this time, I'm going to have prayer and then we'll do the communion. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much, Lord, for being that perfect sacrifice at Calvary. Lord, we owe you more than we can ever pay back. And Lord, we just pray at this time as we partake of this cup and this loaf, we will remember that sacrifice that was made and the forgiveness that is offered through us coming to you and the cross. Lord, at this time we thank you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now at this time, we will partake of the loaf. This represents the broken body that was hung upon the cross. Now at this time, we will partake of the juice, which represents the blood that was shed there at Calvary.
Good morning. Good to see uh, each of you this morning. Uh, I don't know how many of you have ever been into a cave. If you've been uh, into a cave before, uh, beep your horn. If you've been in a cave. Uh, Nate and I had uh, the privilege of some years ago to, to visit Luray Caverns. And uh, we saw their beautiful formations of stalactites and stalagmites. I always forget which one is which. One growing from the bottom, one from the top. There was pools of, of, of wonderful water there. It was a beautiful sight. Um, and everything was just wonderful until at one moment they turned out the lights. And at that moment you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. And all of a sudden what had been a beautiful sight suddenly became a, a, a dark, damp, cold place of isolation and yes, even a, a shrieks of fear that would go through us. I can't imagine getting lost in the depths of a cave. I, I don't know, anybody have ever done that? Ever been lost in a cave? Or been in the darkness so dark that you couldn't find your way out? I think sometimes uh, life can be like that, don't you? It can be like us being lost in a cave. And I'm going to take this off because it's going to make me hot and sweat all around my head if I don't take it off of there. All right. Uh, sometimes life is like that. Uh, our hardships uh, in life, or it makes us feel like it's a cold, dark, damp place, a place of isolation, a place of fear. And uh, I think about a time in the Bible where someone uh, had that type of experience going on. And we read in 1 Samuel 22, 1, that David left Gath and he escaped to the cave of Adullam. This is the time that David was running for his life. He was running from Saul who was chasing him and his army was in pursuit. And it's a long, dark place, if you will, from uh, the palace uh, to a cave. The dampness, the remoteness of that cave, uh, whether you measure it in miles away from the, the palace or the status that he had dropped, David stumbled in this remote cave, and I, I can imagine that maybe at first sight, um, he was just glad to be alive. But he was a man that was completely stripped of everything that he once had. Probably had, only had maybe the shirt on his back, and someone said maybe the, the sword of Goliath to his name. That's all he had. But in those days of, of blackness in the cave, uh, what must have really stung for David uh, we don't find a lot about that. What troubled him, we look in the Bible in 1 Samuel and it looks like maybe, well, in the few verses that are there that he just maybe shrugged it off. It wasn't too tough. Like you and me though, when things go bad, he was hurting. Now, how do we know that? Well, David was a musician. He was a songwriter. And like many songwriters, he often turned his, his troubles uh, into songs. And I, maybe if David would live in today, he'd be a blues writer, you know, because you think about how the blues songs have some powerful lyrics, and uh, he'd been like that. Eric Clapton wrote a ballad, uh, Tears of Heaven, just right after he lost his four-year-old son. And we can think of many Christian songs, like It Is Well With My Soul, that was written by Horatio Spafford after he lost his four-year-old, then he financial loss in the, the Chicago fire, then he lost four of his daughters uh, there on the ship as it went down. Uh, he wrote that song. Well, David wrote many songs, and in one in particular was written from that cave experience. We find it in Psalm 142, where he was hiding, hiding from Saul, nowhere else to go. And he composed this song, if you can imagine, in the dim light of a cave, hiding there, trying to save his life. Listen to what it says. I cry aloud to the Lord. I lift up my voice to the Lord for mercy. I pour out my complaint before Him. Before Him I tell my trouble. When my spirit grows faint within me, it is to you who know my way. In the path where I walk, men have hidden a snare for me. Look to my right and see, no one is concerned for me. I have no refuge. No one cares for my life. I cry to you, O Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Listen to my cry, for I am in desperate need. Rescue me from those who pursue me, for they are too strong for me. Set me free from my prison that I may praise your name. Then the righteous will gather about me because of your goodness to me. I think this psalm gives us a, a tremendous insight into the, the turmoil that David experienced uh, when his life had basically fallen apart. Uh, when he was uh, in a cave dwelling, if you will. And if you're going through a dark, maybe discouraging time, which I think many of us would say this time in our life and in this country, it certainly is like that. Um, we see when our situations are, are low, when things are very discouraging, and we're having these cave experiences, um, our future is unsure. 
what is it that we can do? I think we can learn some things uh, from David and his cave experience. From Psalm 142, I think we can find some, some life lessons, if you will, for us during these days right now where many of us feel locked down, locked in our homes and, and locked away, and, and perhaps life is nowhere near normal, which many of us would like for it to be. First lesson I think they, they teach us, these cave experiences, they show us the need for prayer. Get amen out of that? They show us the need for prayer. Uh, uh, certainly in my life it's been the case. Uh, surveys are showing us that, uh, that more people are praying than ever. So if this if has not done anything else, that people are praying. I think about the, the little boy named Joey who was, uh, his parents are, were there for him to pray one night and they overheard his prayer and he said, Now I lay me down to rest. I hope to pass tomorrow's test. And if I should die before I wake, that's one less test I have to take. <laughs> I think about that, you know, uh, as we're going through life, some of the toughest challenges in our life uh, need to be met with consistent prayer life. But many of us are too busy to pray when everything is going okay. We may go days, we may even go weeks without a meaningful conversation between uh, us and God. And most of us know it's not good. We know it's not healthy for our spiritual lives uh, to live that way. But we have sometimes a hard time breaking that pattern of not praying. We can become so self-sufficient in good times that subconsciously we don't have a real push or urge in our life to pray. I think about the following incident that took place about 30 years ago, actually 40 years ago. It started out in a routine and uneventful flight. It was a flight bound for New York City, and descending to the destination, the pilot realized that the landing gear would not engage. He worked the controls back and forth feverishly, trying again and again to make the landing gear go down on this airliner. No success. Then he asked the control tower for instructions as he was circling the landing field, running out of fuel. Responding to the crisis, the airport personnel sprayed the runway with foam. Fire trucks, emergency vehicles moved into position. For sure, disaster was only moments away. The passengers, meanwhile, were told of each maneuver in that calm, cheery voice that a pilot has. Flight attendants kind of glided about the cabin with an air of cool reserve. Passengers were told to put their heads between their knees to grab their ankles just before impact. This is one of those I can't believe this is happening type of experiences. There were tears for some people. There were a few screams in the airplane. The landing was now just seconds away. Then suddenly, the pilot came over the intercom with this announcement. We are beginning our final descent. At this moment, in accordance with the international aviation codes established at Geneva, it's my obligation to inform you that if you believe in God, you should commence prayer. I'm happy to report that that airplane made a body landing with no one injured. Only the airplane sustained major damage. But you know, yeah, amen. That seems kind of consistent with our prayer life. Have you ever thought about it? I mean, th things are going fine and we don't need to pray, but when there's threats to our life and our limb, to our country, with a disease, you know, I was taking, talk, take, talking to Nadine yesterday as we were out and I made a stop and it seemed kind of surreal to talk to uh, someone behind a, a plastic shield with a, um, me with a mask on and them with a mask on, me with a glove on touching a touchpad. That seemed like something out of another world that I would have never thought would be happening. But it's happening uh, for us right now. So I think we see a time for prayer. We see the need for that. Whether it's what we're going through right now and that, and some of you may be complicated by other things that are happening. As Corey mentioned his prayer, it may be financial difficulties that's going on. Maybe in this, there's some relational crisis that's been exacerbated, if you will, because of what's going on. Maybe there's something in your, your heart right today uh, is breaking that no one else knows about. Or perhaps uh, you need some help from a doctor. Or they found a tumor. Or there's going to be a surgery. Or there's some discoloration. Or maybe it's a sin that you're, you're trying to overcome. Or maybe you're taking part in a sin that you know that you need to be out of. Maybe it's a child that's sick. Maybe it's your 16-year-old that's late for curfew. And something within you is saying you need to pray. James 5.13 says, Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. 
Think about what David said as we go back and look at that text one more time in verse 1 and 2. He says, I cry aloud to you, Lord. I lift up my voice to the Lord for mercy. I pour out my complaint before Him. Before Him. Before Him I tell my trouble. Can't you kind of hear David's words echoing off the cave walls today? He's hurting. He's despairing of life. Intensely aware that he needs to talk to God. That he needs to go to his Creator. And that's sometimes what happens to us with experiences of life. When you experience one, it usually brings you closer to God. That's why you and I need to make sure we're developing a prayer life that's regular when things are good. We tend to say prayer for crisis situations. And if you will, we're out of prayer shape. You know, from reading the Psalms and looking at David, he apparently had a very strong relationship with the Father. He was in prayer shape, if you will. Some of us talk about physically, well, I'm out of shape. You know, I've been found out that recently. We've been trying to do a lot of exercise. And we were out, me and Nadine, uh, this past week playing badminton. About 15 minutes, I was out of breath, you know, just sort of hitting the badminton around. Uh, we, many of you think, maybe you can identify, you're out of shape physically. Well, oftentimes I think we're out of shape in our prayer life as well. If we get in shape, even now, start right now, then as things maybe get worse or if we go through other things, we'll be ready. We'll have a foundation to take place. A second thing that cave experiences do for us, they uproot our self-sufficient and independent spirit. You know, the real root behind a, a prayerless life, it's not busy schedules. Oftentimes we say, well, I'm just too busy to pray or I, I've gotten out of habit. It's really our self-sufficiency. It's our independence that keeps us from praying. We don't want to admit that we've got needs beyond us, beyond our ability to cope with it. We don't like to admit that we can't solve our problems. Now I know for uh, uh, men and women alike this is true, but maybe for men it shows up more. Um, I'll just be honest. Sometimes we, we're one of the last ones to want to ask for directions. Any of you ladies got a horn out there for that one? <laughs> you know, we don't like to ask somebody else to help us with a project. Uh, we want to handle it ourselves. Even if it's too heavy or uh, we really can't handle it, we want to do it ourselves. And I, I hate to admit it, but I remember a time where, I, just stupidity, but me and uh, Mike Caton were out fishing. Mike Caton used to be the minister at Rosemary Church. and um, We took our shirts off because it was a nice sunny day. We wanted to get a little sun. And uh, we had sunscreen on. And I was putting the sunscreen on. But then I got to that little place that you, you can't get right there in the middle of your back, the one that Nadine normally takes care of. I weren't about to ask Mike Caton to rub sunscreen on me. I'm sorry, but he's another man. I'm not going to ask him to put sunscreen on my back, you know. So guess what I did? I didn't get that spot. And so guess what happened? I had a nice burnt spot right in the middle of my back, pretty big, right where I couldn't reach that sunscreen. It was a reminder that I was self-sufficient, that I was too big a man to ask. And we don't like to ask for help, do we? We don't. We'd rather say, I can do it myself. Someone said we're legends in our own mind. Someone else said egotism is the only disease that makes everyone else sick. Independent, a self-sufficient spirit. That's the primary reason that most of us don't go to God in prayer. We don't need Him. Proverbs says pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall, Proverbs 16, 18. It's kind of like a man swimming across a, the ocean or across a, a sound. Too big a body of water for him to swim across. You come alongside with a boat you offer him a life preserver, and he said, nope, I got it. And then he, he goes and he drowns. We won't take help or ask for help because of our pride. And what happens? We drown, we drown, if you will, in our own pride. It keeps us from getting help. Oh, I've got my marriage. I know I'm having problems, but we got it. We don't need to talk to anybody. Oh, I've got this financial thing going on in my life. I don't need to talk to any financial counselor. We got it. I can do it. Uh, we got this. And we go into, into cave experiences and we face reality, we're not as self-sufficient as we think we are. I don't know about you, but I believe this virus has shown most of us that we don't got this. We can't do anything about this to cure it. We may come in contact with it, even though we, we do everything possible. I was, reading, I was reading this past week about a surgeon they had a great big funeral for, and I think he was over... Uh, in England. But I was telling Nadine, I was thinking, you know, of all the people that would be protected, that would do everything possible, you'd think it would be a surgeon that would keep from getting something like this. You know, I don't know how much 
uh, independent spirit you have, but I look at David and I look at how he acknowledged his own uh, insufficiency. Look what he said in verse 3. My spirit grows faint within me. Verse 4. I have no refuge. Verse 6. Listen to my cry for I am in desperate need. That's not a man that's going to do it by himself, is it? He says, I'm in desperate need. Rescue me from those who pursue me for they are too strong for me. Those are the words of a man that realize he can't solve it all by himself. He needs God. And we need God, folks. We need to go to Him. We're not so self-sufficient. Amen. We can't do it all by ourselves. We need to go to Him. A third thing that cave experiences do for us, they teach us to find comfort in God's providence. David acknowledges that, that God is behind even these circumstances that seem difficult. Look what he said in verse 3 again. When my spirit grows faint within me, it is you who know my way. David is saying that even in spite of all these things that are going against him, God knows it. And it's under his control. And he is working out things to be a part of David's life, to be a plan that. There's an old saying goes that, that God has his eye on, on the temperature gauge and his hand on the thermostat. He's in control. We know it well. All things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. We hear the verse. Maybe we can even quote Romans 8.28. But so often, we don't really live it. And when the crisis comes, perhaps we forget it. Or maybe we haven't really believed it all our life. You know, that promise is one of the most precious promises in the Bible that a Christian has over and over again, what he's saying in these dark cave experiences, like many of us are going through right now, we tend to, to oftentimes ignore that or forget that promise. We, we don't consider the events of our life to be part of God's ultimate plan or that God could allow this to happen so that we could learn to depend on Him more. Possibly that's what's happening right now. It's a wake-up call for the world that we don't have this. Only with Him do we have it. Now, we could march people up here, I believe, today, one after another, who have survived cave experiences, and they would tell you how God used that for their good. I know I can tell you, and I know many of you could too as well, that God has taken something rotten, something stinking, a lemon in your life, and made lemonade, as we talked about a few weeks earlier. You see, it may be possible um, for us to see later on Maybe not right while we're going through it. It seems impossible. But later on to see how God has even used the death of a loved one. A, a, a diagnosis that's horrible. A, a disease that's terrible. To use these things. A, a marriage problem that's, that seems insurmountable. To use these things to bring us to Him. Maybe a job loss. Look at Lamentations 3. Who can speak and have it happen if the Lord is not decreed it? Lamentations 3, 37 and 38. Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both calamities and good things come? God does allow some pretty tough circumstances in our life, but He promises that with those circumstances, He's going to go along with us. That He's going to help us. That He's going to work out in such a way that there will be some good to come from it. As we know the verse well, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And we can. A fourth thing that this experience tells us, these cave experiences, they point others towards God if we handle them well. We look at verse 7. He speaks of God, uh, David speaks of what God's going to do as he rescues him. He says, Set me free from my prison, that I may praise your name, that the righteous will gather around me because of your goodness to me. Notice that David praises God for his deliverance. That deliverance may come in, in many different ways and perhaps... Maybe not even in the way that we thought it would come or we prayed for. The illness may not be cured. The relationship may not be put together. The job may not be secured. But God is praised nonetheless. And praising God is essential. That's what David is saying. The second thing we see is others are going to come to see how you responded to it and how God responded to it. You know, it, it would be awesome if... It, everything we, we prayed for, some miraculously way, turned around, events turned around that way. But we know that God doesn't always work like that. Others are going to be drawn to you even when that doesn't happen. When there isn't some type of miraculous thing going on. But they will be drawn to you if you draw your strength from God. 
Your faithfulness during those dark times shows people that they've got something, those who are outside of Christ, they've got something that, that, that they want. You've got something that they want. The faithfulness of God speaks so loud during those cave experiences. That's why we're reading, that's why we're studying behind David today. That David was a man after God's own heart. And he had strength outside himself from God. I'd like to close with a story that I heard Bob Russell tell about a couple from his church in Southeast, uh, Claude and Amanda Tackett. They were this typical couple, if you will, living in Louisville, Kentucky, members of the Southeast. And um, he completed law school. He was doing well in his first uh, year as a job as a lawyer. And uh, Amanda was giving birth to her first child, whose name was Luke. Their first teachers of family seemed like it was everything was bright. I mean, the present looked so, so good. But then all of a sudden, just like that, things came crashing down around them. Three days after she gave birth to Luke, while still in the hospital, Amanda got out of bed, put the baby in the bassinet, Claude was asleep, and suddenly Claude was awakened by the sound of Amanda crying out in pain, crying his name. She was grasping the side of the bed, doubled over in pain. Claude hit the nurse call button, and the next minute the room turned into a scene like right out of the ER, people all over the nurses took Amanda's blood pressure. She didn't have any. They made Claude leave the room. And within a few minutes, the doctor came out to inform Claude that his wife Amanda had died of a pulmonary embolism. In layman terms, she had a massive blood clot that was lodged between the artery between her heart and her lungs. Claude was left with a three-year-old son and no wife. A couple of months later, Claude sat down with a reporter from the Louisville uh, newspaper I want you to listen to what he told the, the newspaper and the people of Louisville. You're talking about a witness. He said, I wish I could say I was strong, that I never questioned God, that I always trusted and believed, but it's so hard. Every night for nine months, we prayed that God would keep Luke and Amanda safe. Every night for nine months. Frankly, there were several days that I looked despair right in the eye. But then he said, there's no way that you could live like that. And he went on as he looked at his tiny baby sleeping in his lap. And he said, I've got only one dream for Luke. This is the primary goal of my life. My goal is that my son will not spend a single moment outside the will of God. That when he realizes that he needs a Savior, the next instant he will give his life in faithful obedience to Jesus. I want Luke to see his mother one day. How are you handling cave experiences. How are you doing with what's going on right now in your life? Are you learning? Are you growing? Are you training? Are you praying? Are you pointing others to God through the way that you're handling what's going on right now? Let's pray and we'll have our closing song. God, God, thank You for Your blessings. Thank You for loving us and giving us Your Son, Jesus. We thank You, Father, even for the difficult cave experiences in our life that oftentimes we know are hard to go through. And right now, many have come here with heavy hearts, searching for hope and searching for answers. Lord, we ask that today that You help us to see these things in our life as things that would point us to You, that would draw us close to You, that would help us, Father, to surrender all the self-sufficiency in our life and realize we can't do it alone. We couldn't save ourselves. Only Jesus could do that on the cross, dying for our sins. We can't save ourselves from all the things in this life. We know that it's appointed for man once to die, and then the judgment. We know, Father, that there's many things in this life that we just can't do. And we look to you today for our strength, for our answers, for our hope. Help us, Lord, when we're weak. Help us, Lord to lean on You. And Lord, if there's someone here today needs to make their decision to put their, their life in Your hands, to give their lives to You, Lord, I pray that they would do that. They would believe in You as Lord and Savior. They would confess You as Lord. They would repent of their sins. They'd be baptized into Your body, the church. And Father, that they would be welcome into Your arms, Father, so that we'd have the hope of heaven. Thank You, Lord. We love You. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing our closing song today, I Surrender All.
songs we make uh, when we sing it. Who are we singing to? That's right, God. I surrender all to Him. There's a little course I learned in uh, camp some years ago, and I think I'm going to try to, to sing it as we close today. Um, I think I am. <clears throat> Thou art my hiding place. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me. From trouble, thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. You guys have a blessed week. Amen. Hey, you heard that before? Okay. I weren't sure if it was, it's an oldie though, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah.